Hello, my name is Susan Hirata, and I'm the programming director for the Disorient Asian American Film Festival of Oregon. Welcome to our 16th annual and first virtual film festival. Thank you for tuning in to our Q&A for Down a Dark Stairwell. The Disorient Asian American Film Festival is based in Eugene, Oregon. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that the city of Eugene is located on Kalapuya Ilihi, the traditional indigenous homeland of the Kalapuya people. Following treaties between 1851 and 1855, Kalapuya people were dispossessed of their indigenous homeland by the United States government and forcibly removed to the coast reservation in Western Oregon. Today, descendants are citizens of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians of Oregon. And they continue to make important contributions in their communities and across the land we now refer to as Oregon. We express our respect for all federally recognized tribal nations of Oregon. And this includes the Burns Paiute Tribe, the Confederated Tribes of the Coos, Lower Umpqua and Sayuslaw Indians, the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde Community of Oregon, the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians of Oregon, the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, the Coquille Indian Tribe, the Cow Creek Band of Umpqua Tribe of Indians, and the Klamath Tribes. We also express our respect for all other displaced indigenous peoples who call Oregon home. We are pleased and grateful to bring down a dark stairwell to Oregon and our Eugene and Portland communities in particular. These past nine months have seen unprecedented protests involving peaceful citizens of all ages, armed citizens, state and local police and the Oregon National Guard. It is our hope that this film and Q&A can spark a much needed conversation in our communities around systemic racism, polices, policing, and our criminal justice system, and inspire all of us to raise our voices in solidarity with all marginalized communities and specifically with Black Lives Matter. It's my pleasure to introduce our host for today, Jason Mack. Jason is one of the founders of the Disorient Asian American Film Festival of Oregon and a past executive director. They are a diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility practitioner and community organizer with over 20 years of experience within large government and educational organizations. Welcome, Jason. Hey, thanks so much, Susan. I really yeah. appreciate all your work on the festival. We'll see you in a little bit. Okay, thanks for hosting and I'll leave it to you. Great, thanks. So I'm Jason Mack, I'm your host uh, for uh, this afternoon. Uh, we'll be having a, a question and answer with filmmakers of Down a Dark Stairwell. Um, it's a powerful documentary about the 2014 shooting of a Kai Gurley, an unarmed black man by Peter Liang a Chinese American police officer in a darkened stairwell of a housing project in New York City. The film captures the complex political and racial divisions that followed. But before we begin, I'd like to uh, start with a moment of silence for Akai Gurley. Thank you. I am so honored uh, to, to be hosting a Q&A and introducing um, our director, producer, and cinematographer, Ursa, Ursula Liang, and uh, editor Jason, or J.M. Harper, um, today. Uh, Ursula Liang is a journalist turned filmmaker. After working in print, including ESPN the Magazine, T, the New York Times Magazine, Hyphen Magazine, which uh, I love. Uh, she directed two critically acclaimed, acclaimed feature documentaries, Nine Men, which we showed a few years ago at Disorient, some of you may remember it, and of course, Down a Dark Stairwell. Uh, 
currently she freelances as a film and television producer. One October, Third Act, Gloves Off, UFC Countdown, UFC Primetime, and Story Consultant. Ursula lives in the Bronx, New York. Welcome, Ursula. And next we have uh, Jason or J.M. Harper. I believe he uh, prefers Jason. Um, and J Jason is a documentarian. Down, his, down, a <laughs> down a Dark Stairwell is his third documentary feature as editor. His documentary, Don't Go Telling Your Mama, won the jury award at the 2021 Sundance Film Festival. Congratulations on that one. Um, as director, uh, his work has been featured in Adweek, Venmeo, Staff Picks, Fader, and The Guggenheim. And uh, wow, he's working on some cool documentary projects, uh, which I think uh, we'll talk save for later um, as dessert. How's that? Sounds good. So first, uh, I'd love to congratulate you on such a powerful and moving film. Um, as a second generation uh, Chinese American uh, who believes deeply in transformative justice, uh, I, I had so many conflicting feelings while watching. Uh, you know, I, I was feeling, you know, hurt, anger, uh, relief, um, just all the different feelings because I related so much to all the different characters uh, in your film. But I, I got to say, uh, in, in my two screenings, uh, each scene was like a gut punch, like one after the other. Um, and I, I was just thinking through this, and as filmmakers, as human beings, uh, what was it personally like in the process of making this film for you? Uh, it's definitely a hard film to make. Um, my last film was my first film, and that was hard for many different reasons, uh, including the fact that I sort of had to carry all my equipment on a Chinatown bus across the country and work with no money and not knowing what I was doing. But this one, um, working with organizers and working with a subject that's so traumatic to all the people involved was was really draining. And I think I, I think a lot about like sort of um, different types of trauma. You know, of course, um, Akai Gurley and his family experienced a very specific kind of devastating trauma, um, but the organizers that were working with them experienced their own types of trauma in the process of organizing and, and as well as the ones that were working on Peter Liang's side. Um, and, and then as filmmakers, we experience trauma too, just sort of, um, and sort of all these different levels of trauma um, get to be expressed in different ways because um, there's sort of, um, I think you're you're allowed to express certain types of trauma, and and then I think there's there's times when you really have to hold back um, your personal feelings and your personal emotions because the people around you are, are experiencing so much more. So I think it was a really difficult film to make, and um, you know, practically speaking, it was very difficult to make because uh, it was very complicated. And Jason and our other editor Michelle had a really tough job in in um, piecing together a narrative that would ultimately become the film. What about you, Jason? Um, when Ursula invited me to, uh, to uh, edit the film, um, I, I was able to walk into it at an interesting stage where, where some of the initial ideas were just starting to sort of find themselves. Um, and I think Ursula was very deliberate in bringing on um, a black editor so that we had both a black editor and an Asian American editor. Um, which, which is a, a layer of experience that as an editor, you, it's usually not a, a part that's considered, but for this was, I think, quite important. And so my experience with the film was a journey of learning more about the Asian American community. And um, it, it was just a, a process of, of discovery, really, trying to represent the, the Black and African American community as I know it and try to keep those characters true to my experience. And then also just learn how to take in, in the world of the Asian American experience and integrate the two. Um, yeah, it, it was a project unlike, unlike any other for sure. Wow. I should okay. say it was also really enjoyable, like the collaboration process, um, getting to sit and edit with Jason and Michelle, uh, both like over many, many months was, I mean, there was a lot of behind the scenes exploration and learning too. And I think that was like 
something that I really hope other filmmakers will do is sort of model the world that you want to see. Um, you know, like we were trying to make a film about sort of um, people listening to each other and and communicating and or not <laughs> and having some sort of solidarity or not. And we were at the same time sort of like unintentionally or intentionally exploring those same sort of themes in our own um, filmmaking. How did you uh, pick your your collaborators? Like, uh, or were they folks you already knew, or um, did uh, you find them on worked, Craigslist? Yeah, I wish I could get them on Craigslist that easily. Michelle and I had worked together on Nine Man, so she edited that film, and so we had a, a language together that was very familiar and comfortable. And Jason, um, it was actually a really beautiful. I believe in fate a lot. It was like sort of a beautiful meeting because I had tried to go to a film at Tribeca and couldn't get a ticket. I was the last person in line, couldn't get one. And then I walked like 25 minutes to the other theater to see if I could see something else with my pass. And I happened to be able to go into a screening of A Kid from Coney Island, which is a film about Stefan Marbury, a NBA player who, as many people know, um, came to a lot of fame in China. He has like a museum dedicated to him in China and um, has a real, you know, is learning Chinese and has like a real love for Chinese culture and a real um, relationship with China. And so, um, you know, Jason got up at the end and did the Q&A and he was one of the editors on that film. And I was like, oh, interesting. Here's a, here's a, a black filmmaker that is making a film about a, an athlete, you know, and my whole background is in, in uh, sports journalism. Um, and he happens to be one of the very significant ones in like sort of the Chinese American and Chinese community. So I just, you know, said hello at that point and, and thought about him a lot um, in, the, in the time being. But also Jason comes from this like really special space where he's doing commercial work and like really creative stuff that bends more into like the narrative world. And at the time that I wanted to bring him on, I was really looking for somebody to help um, push some of the, like the more um, creative ideas in the film and bring a little like style and sexiness to it. And Jason has that um, skill set. So it was, um, it was, you know, he, he was, you know, the color of his skin was definitely not the main reason he got picked. You know, he knows what he's doing and he, he offered something very practically brilliant to the film. So um, it, it, it felt like all things came together in just the right way. Yeah, I love the pacing of the film. It, it is, um, it, it kept you on your edge, edge of your seat. And mm -hmm. like I said, kept delivering punch after punch. And mm -hmm. um, that's always a great sign. Less is more, right? Uh, I'm curious, did, I, I assume that you had like tons and tons of footage. Um, I'm sure not all of it made it, hence editing, yeah. right? Right. Um, Ursula has a shooting style, which is, um, it's just classic verite, which is like, turn the camera on and it just rolls. Uh, so the takes were, were frequently, you know, an hour long. Um, and she, it's just all um, that type of coverage. So she's, Oh, if she's operating the camera herself, which, which she did for for um, a good a good amount of the doc, um, uh, it's all these little moments that that style of of, um, of of directing, you know, filmmaking produces really interesting opportunities to sort of see people and to go for the moments that usually happen between, you know, stop and re record. Um, which was as an editor gives you, I mean, the volume that you have to go through is, is significant but it's worth it because you end up getting these little moments that you would never have gotten otherwise. Um, and with that, you can create things like pace and, or, or you, can, you can start to pull together aspects like the idea of the train moving through this sort of unstoppable force moving through, um, which can be a figure for a lot of things in the dock, but in that you see these sort of flashes Anybody, I'm sorry, my cat is uh, meowing in the background. If you can no problem. Um, <laughs> um, what, what I loved about Ursula doing these long takes on, on the subways is she was like traveling between the different Chinatowns, for example, um, like whether it was in, um, uh, in the city or in Queens, um, she would just record all of that. And it, it became, as, we, as the movement, as the Asian American movement in support of, of Peter Liang moved across the country and like across the world, really, we could use that as a figure for, um, for what was happening. And so, uh, yeah, that was the way that she shot it. And it, yes, it was a lot to go through, uh, hundreds of hours, but, but it gave us the opportunity to make something like what we made. What was she paying you by the hour? 
um, confidential confidential information. Okay. Enough to make the uh, the film as it was. I would do I would do it for free. I mean, it was like it was a real pleasure working for Ursula because she she like she was saying she approaches everything very journalistically, and I'm sure some of the questions that we'll get into have to do with like one of the biggest points of feedback from people was something that was like constantly on Ursula's mind and through private screenings that we would do was this idea that it was not a, a court case film. Like it wasn't actually about the case. It was about a right. whole nother layer of tectonic shifting that was being, that was happening between communities. And we had to cut and recut to try to get there. Um, but that, that was a journey that it was, it was just very, very specific. And it's great to follow a director who has a very specific idea of, of where we're going. The next question I have is actually around um, uh, uh, access to your subjects and how you chose, who you chose. Uh, it, it seems like uh, the film is really well balanced in terms of the different viewpoints and you don't really get a reveal of sort of um, uh, what, what your narrative stance is as a filmmaker until the very end. Um, so if you could just talk about what was that process like? How did, how did you um, get access into these different communities? And if um, just being who you are um, affected how people would interact with you? Yeah, I mean, I did want to point out that we, I started filming very late in the timeline of the film. Um, so we actually started, I actually started filming myself at the point of conviction. So I had missed a whole bunch of the storytelling up until then visually. And I was lucky enough to um, form some relationships with some other filmmakers who had been at NYU and, and were working on a project. And so they, you know, some of the some of the incredible footage we have comes from third party material sources. And I, you know, I think the role of like citizen journalists and other filmmakers, it can't be sort of um, underscored enough in a film like this. Um, but also, you know, the you know, when I got to the scene, I was interested, um, you know, I think it's always complicated with the Asian American community. I feel maybe this is my own reading of it, but I feel like the Asian American community always wants to bubble up certain people. And it always is like a certain type of political figurehead that they want to see on, on screen representing whatever the opinion is. And so, I'm, and I felt that way with making Nine Man too. I was like, hey, everyone's going to argue about who I filmed and who I didn't film. Um, but in this case, I actually just tried to, um, find the people that were adjacent to Peter um, and like the people who were really, um, you know, and ask other people who they thought were sort of the leaders. And we for sure missed a lot of them, but um, you know, the, there was some, in, some specific interest on the Asian American side in making sure that we showed like a multiplicity of characters there because as folks who know and understand like the, the, uh, the dynamism of our community, like you have folks that, that represent very different things. You know, you have one character that is like, you know, a, a Chinatown guy, he's so Chinatown that he has like a, you know, a New York-y accent. And um, there are, you know, all these like fifth generation Asian American types. And then there are some newer immigrants that come from like working class backgrounds and some newer immigrants that come from um, privileged backgrounds because of the immigration patterns. And so like those sort of different communities were people I was trying to represent. Um, and with the African-American community, the black community, we were, you know, we were looking at the folks that were actually doing a lot of the organizing at that time. Um, we, of course, wanted a family member. Um, and what what I did think might be a problem was my last name, because I do have the same last name as the officer. And, you know, Asian Americans know it's very popular and it's, you know, top 10 Asian Chinese names. But um, I thought that might be a problem for me in gaining access. So what I did is I, I approached people on the street and, uh, you know, I approached uh, Akai's aunt first at, you know, speak out. And told her ultimately what my name was. And she said, yeah, that probably would have triggered me if I'd seen that in an email in my inbox, like as some sort of request. And so um, so I just made that choice going forward that I was going to like, you know, build, build relationships through other characters and approach folks in the street where I could. Um, and, you know, the Asian American community, I definitely, is definitely a community where you um, gain a lot by having um, relationships. And so I had made a film that took me a long time in Chinatown and I had relationships where people were introducing me to folks. And so that, um, you know, that introduction kind of um, access is, is important um, and, and proved useful for that. So how, how long was your uh, production process? Uh, we really started filming in 2016 and we released the film in 
what is this year? <laughs> what was last year? <laughs> 25. <laughs> so, I mean, I guess, year. Like, yeah, like start to finish, it was, you know, three and a half years or close to four years um, of, of our, you know, our work on the project. Um, but, you know, of course the case happened in 2014. So there was two years of, of stuff that we missed. Um, and I do feel like that's an accomplishment, you know, from like the technical standpoint of filmmaking, I feel like that's an accomplishment because we were trying, I, I definitely had this, there were folks that I think would have thought that this could have been told in a little more of a historical nature, like in a hindsight kind of, uh, you know, evaluation. And I thought that like, you know, I knew that this was a significant Asian American story and that this would be something that we taught in Asian American studies classes 20 years from now. So it could have been done in that way. But I also thought like, how precious is this that we can, we're actually here to catch some of this and we can tell it as an in the moment story. So Jason and Michelle were tasked with like, this needs to like, let's cut out all the past tense and let's like make it drive and, and feel like it's in the past present tense. And I think that's actually very valuable because you know, now this is, now we're what, uh, I can't do math very well at all, but we were five years, you know, six years later or whatever it is. And, um, and there are so many things about this film that still feels so current. I mean, in a very sad way because of where we are with uh, police accountability, but also, you know, in this moment now where we're talking about um, Asian hate crimes, anti-Asian bias and so the coronavirus, there's droppings of that in the film. And when you can watch it in sort of a present tense, it feels, it feels uh, you know, both prescient and, um, and like really right, right of the moment. Um, and there's, you know, I, I, so I'm, I'm glad we chose to do it that way. I, I do want to ask you a question about um, that particular part, especially the scene where I, I think it's a press conference where they're talking about um, an anti-Asian um, um, uh, crime um, that was um, purportedly done by uh, some African-Americans. Um, I'm curious if... Um, uh, that was just an isolated incident, or was that um, part of a larger trend? Um, how did you actually uh, see that play out? Um, that was a that was a scene that was definitely on the like cutting room floor for a lot of people because they didn't see the direct relevance of it. But I I thought it was important to include because whether or not there was any real association between that event and the case, someone in the community was saying that they felt that it was related, and so. Um, and you know this idea of a hate crime is a very complicated thing, which I think is not getting talked about enough in today's like um, moment. Because you know, hate crime is a very serious charge, which which results in so much more um, punitive action. Um, but I, um, you know, actually, what was really happening around that time was there was a lot of um, social media. This was like right before the election, so um, the Trump election, and so there was actually a lot of social media discord, um, race inter or racial discord. And I think, you know, some people will argue that that was like being um, inflamed by foreign governments and things like that. But, you know, it was at a time when, you know, things that happen on social media, um, especially in the Asian American bubbles are very, you know, the, the, the nice happy stories about like, you know, uh, other communities don't get across in our social media. What, we're, what we were seeing at that time in New York was actually stories of like, Asian people getting pushed onto the subway tracks. There was a there was a man who was obviously mentally disturbed who was slashing like Asian women's necks. So there were like actual things happening um, that and and uh, a lot of like delivery uh, people getting beat up. Mm -hmm. um, some of these were by other people of color. Some of them were not. But all those types of like anti Asian crimes, uh, whether they were crimes of opportunity or racist crimes or hate crimes or whatever. Um, those were things that were being passed around on the internet. So this to a lot of people um, felt, you know, the Peter Lian case at the time felt like a, it's in no way sort of like a linear progression from those things, but it felt like a, like a straw that broke the camel's back. I think people were seeing a lot of anti-Asian behavior and sort of feeling more and more invisible and more and more victimized by so many different things. So um, that's not included in the film, but that was the context of what was happening at that time. And then there, of course, there were also like, I think maybe shortly after there was a lot of like, uh, a lot of viral like black and Asian content too about like nail salons and things happening in nail salons and people having, taking positions on either side and affirmative action stuff, which is in the film. So, um, you know, like for me, it was, uh, it was clear that, th that we were not having conversations that we should have been having for, for a long time. I mean, I think conversations were being had in certain circles and intellectual circles and activist circles, but the, the greater majority of people who are getting information and misinformation and salacious information from from their online bubbles, which are more and more like 
ethnic silos, um, that, you know, those folks were not having conversations. Wow, sort of these ethnic enclaves um, uh, online. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'm really curious uh, around a couple of scenes that uh, in my mind are juxtaposed. I don't remember if it was or wasn't actually, but um, the scene with um, the African-American activists when they're talking about um, sort of what, what types of protest chants around uh, and somebody suggested something around a model minority um, and uh, there was a, you know, a, a large discussion around uh, um, why why that shouldn't be used. Um, what was one one scene, and then um, a couple of scenes there. There was the the uh, Chinese principal who was um, telling people not to celebrate or um, telling them not to yell. Um, and, and I thought that that was really interesting and sort of um, showing how um, there there's even conflict uh, within a lot of the the leadership uh, around how how do you approach this? Um, did you did you ever want to just like uh, drop the camera and start saying your piece? I mean, or I always. I always want to drop my camera and, and participate. That's where I have a hard time because I have a big mouth usually. And the personal challenge for me in filmmaking is to stay quiet because you have to get the sound bites. Um, but yeah, those are those things are uh, no, a lot of people have not put those things next to each other. They're definitely very far apart from each other in the film. Um, and I actually thought that those were. Um, I actually did maybe at those moments didn't feel like I needed to jump in because I thought there was such like intelligent conversation being ha happening in those spaces. And I thought that was important for people to see, um, you know, and I was felt very lucky that we got those things on camera. Um, a lot of what was being put in the media and, and you'll see in the film too, is these sort of these louder moments where people are yelling at each other in the streets, but, um, but these very thoughtful, um, conversations are happening like within these bubbles, I, I think are important ones to have. Like we need to have these conversations. And um, I thought it was really beautiful to see like the Akai Gurley uh, organizers talk about that stuff. Um, you know, they were talking not about that model minority chant for the younger people in that group was not just about Peter, it was about Ken Thompson. So they saw mm -hmm. sort of what they saw as like a buppity black man who was selling out their community um, oh, as, uh, you know, as, as a model, as a person that fit into that model minority category, not, not knowing sort of like the historical or intellectual definition of that word. Um, so it was, um, that was interesting to watch. And I think a lot of people think that like a lot of these protests where people are pouring into the streets, like, you know, holding up Black Lives Matter signs are, are just like expressions of anger, but they're not, they're, they're, there's a lot of like really careful organizing that's going on and a lot of like long-term planning and thoughtful um, debate that is going into these movements and, and everybody's working a long game. And so I think that's, um, I think it's very important for Asian Americans to know that, uh, that these are, these are very thoughtful strategized um, movements. And that's why the black community has been so successful in making so much positive change in this country and, and leading so many social justice movements. Um, and you know that the uh, the scene at the end, which you know is again an in community um, thing, where it, it's actually a different guy. It's another um, guy, but another person that was very involved in the Peter Liang organizing, who shushes those folks. I mean, that was to me was very interesting in the making of the film to discover or to be witness to this sort of um, new Asian American organizing. And I think everybody, whether or not they agreed with the Peter Liang protesters has a, a great amount of pride in the fact that people stood up for something and that they um, that they were able to like actually organize all these people to come out into the streets because the, the numbers show that there was actually some very specific effort that went behind getting people out. And in and, and, and real ways, they see, probably moved the needle in this case. And so um, it was very interesting to see the sort of nascent uh, movement developing. You know, when you're looking at the big Cadman Plaza protests, for example, they don't have the legacy of the civil rights movement and all the chants that would be said by, you know, the black community, they have one chant and it's just justice. That's all they're saying. And they're holding up one sign that says one thing. And it's like a very limited language because uh, it hasn't been, the, the folks haven't been organizing long enough. And and I guess if you're talking about um, the Asian Americans who are organizing on behalf of the girly uh, community, their argument is that Asian Americans have been organizing for a very long time and they've been organizing in solidarity with 
the Black community for a long time, but these greater masses of the Asian Americans have not been participating in that. And so I think one of the challenges for us as a community is to figure out how to lasso these larger movements and to meet those folks who are just learning the language, like both literally and figuratively, like where they are. You know, there, are, I think that um, a lot of times these movements are using um, terms and concepts that are very uh, complicated. Um, I know they might sound simple, something like saying like white supremacy is, uh, you know, a lot of people know what that means, but I think it's a very, it's a very complicated term. And like, can we meet folks, especially people who are um, ESL or limited English um, at a place where, where they are and start to like break down these conversations for them in a different way? Yeah. Uh, wow. I, 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 I personally was really struggling with some of those scenes. Um, in um, especially as a Chinese American, I uh, when the the plaza images were showing up, I was thinking that's kind of my parents' generation, uh, and uh, I, I felt myself um, uh, really identifying with like uh, Kathy Dang um, in in the film, who is the the uh, organizer from what is it C A A V CAV. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought it was interesting that scene where she talks about um, being threatened. And I assume it's from um, other Asian Americans. I mean, um, I don't know if we can, I don't know if she or we could actually say, I mean, she does mention that a lot of the, you know, she got doxxed, which is a terrible thing to happen to mm -hmm. somebody, but that she couldn't get certain things taken down because they were hosted on servers in China. So, you know, I think, I think what was happening to her was really real and really terrible, no matter what side of the coin you're on. Um, and we, sh you know, this whole idea of how people behave online is, is needs to be really rethought. But, you know, that could have also been that could have also been part of this whole like, uh, you know, Russian China interference. Who knows? Like where people are just um, stirring up conflict, um, or it could have been organizers. It could have been people that knew her very well. It could have been could have been anybody. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it. Uh, I don't think in some ways it doesn't matter who it is. It, it does if it's if it's organizers that are pretending to do good and are turning around and being awful human beings and threatening people. But um, the sum of it is that that uh, she was like really living in fear and um, and that took a toll on her ability to do her work, you know, her job and her and fight for what she thought um, what she believed in. Mm. I was wondering if there are any questions from our uh, eventive audience. Go ahead and type them in. Um, we'll make sure that we we answer the ones that we can. Um, but uh, I, I wanted to ask also about uh, ha have the various subjects of the films uh, actually seen it or screened it yet? Um, a number of them have, and a number of them are waiting, and a number of them have not given me feedback also. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's been, this has been, a, you know, releasing the film during the pandemic poses a lot of challenges, and one is, like, having a moment to have everybody come to a screening and sit in a room together or and experience uh, what it's like to sort of give something of yourself and a very traumatic story, put it on screen and have people react to it, which, you know, can go many different ways. But I do think, um, I think it's, I think it is rewarding for a lot of subjects to see when their film, when their story brings like further debate or, um, you know, just touches people. So I, you know, Giz, for example, Akai's um, friend uh, who you see in the beginning of the film, he is, um, you know, he saw the film and he was, I think, you know, he was very vulnerable on screen. You know, he, he teared, we had just met him that day and he became very emotional. And, uh, you know, there's so much more that that's in the raw footage that Jason has seen and Michelle has seen and I've seen. And, um, you know, he's a person that's holding a lot. And, and I think that he, you know, his response to the film that he was, he was very happy that he shared. And I think um, I was worried that he, you know, when somebody shares in that way, especially like, you know, a tough guy in a t-shirt, like you worry about their regret of, you know, sharing and, and you worry about like your relationship with them as you move forward and like, you know, taking, being extractive and taking stories from people and putting them on screen. So I've tried to really like stay in touch with him and, and 
sort of parse through what he's feeling. And, um, and he was, I think, felt very happy that his feelings, not only his feelings, but the experiences of, of young black men were represented on screen. Um, we also like wanted to make sure that he was involved in other ways. And so he actually, I don't know if everybody watching sat through the credits, a lot of people turn off when the credits start, but there's an original song that plays during the credits. And um, he actually wrote, uh, a co you know, co-wrote that with Chops, um, an Asian American hip hop producer. And those are original lyrics that he made um, to sort of express his feelings around the, the case. And uh, he uses a different stage name. So I think it's sometimes hard to know that um, that's him, but it is him and he's writing about his friends. So um, that was a really moving experience for me to be in the, the uh, studio with him and a bunch of his friends as they, you know, I, I've never been in like a recording studio where they're doing rap, but like, you know, they're writing on the spot and they're, um, you know, there was this like really beautiful moment with all these young black men, like supporting each other and like trying to figure out how to express this stuff. And we would be in the other room waiting for them to come back and like deliver another line. And, uh, you know, like, you know, like the magic that Jason and I got to experience together in the edit, it was the same kind of thing where I felt like really privileged to be part of this sort of creative process with them too. Wow. Uh, we have a question in the chat. It says, uh, have any community leaders recommended that Peter Liang do some of his community service to benefit the African-American community? I am not aware that anyone recommended that. Um, I was actually surprised following, you know, I, I don't read all the news and justice stories in the, in, the, in the space, but I was surprised when he did end up doing his community service, which he has not completed that he was doing community service in an Asian American like old folks home. So he actually directly served the, um, the Asian American community with his community service. Um, I, you know, I don't think there are really rules. I don't know, I, someone else knows more than me. Jason, do you know more than me about like this, about parole and like uh, just community I'm not, service? Not about, uh, yeah, I'm not sure who ultimately decided that he'd be there, but there there have been questions in, in, in other um, Q and A's that we've done around you know, sort of what he's doing now. Um, and I think in the, it's interesting living in, in I live in, in Brooklyn in Bed-Stuy and there are like this past summer, like in, in a park, um, there are images of like Akai's face and the many other faces of, of, um, of people who've fallen victim to, to police brutality in one way, shape or form. Um, so Akai's presence in our community is I think still felt, um, but Peter's relationship to his community is one that's very different now. Um, and I, I think, Whereas he was sort of toted as a, not a hero, whatever you'd call that. Like son he, of Chinatown, yeah. Kind of something. Yeah, yeah, very much so. And the way that the documentary puts it is that, he's, you know, he's kind of has an almost childlike face and he's just very, yeah, just son of Chinatown, just a, just a good a good kid is, is the image that was sort of painted. Um, and then after, in the aftermath, when everything was kind of said and done, um, not that he had any uh, political motivations uh, of, of sort of remaining a face or I, I don't know, but he, I think he has kind of disappeared. Um, whereas Sakai remains, um, yeah, one of the many faces that stand for what happened. Yeah, I mean, an update on that, they also, um, Kirby and others have been able to uh, convince the city to rename a street in East New York for Akai. So they will be, um, and also I don't, I don't know if this person has a relationship, but I know that um, during this su summer or season of, uh, so, you know, all this stuff going on, uh, NFL players were allowed to put names on the back of their jersey, and somebody wore Kai Gurley on the back of their jersey. Um, it was another player named Gurley. I'm not sure if they're related, but um, yeah. So um, yeah, Peter has definitely. I, I think he, whether or not this is due to his um regret or or personal feelings of uh sadness about his own life like he's really wanted to put everything behind him and i think for him the the stress of the film is that it will um you know keep bringing his name up and keep him in the spotlight and it's something that i think is this this what happened was is very hard for him to deal with and he wants to put it behind himself so hmm. Um, Susan has a question. Also, I'm sorry, someone was asking about sort of restorative justice and things like that. Um, I do know that, you know, Peter met with um, um, uh, 
Akai's domestic partner, Kimberly, and she actually um, appreciated that meeting that was, you know, organized at some point, I don't know, around the time of the trial. Um, I do know that the, that a lot of the organizers like would not even want to come to a screening where the other organizers were sitting in the same room. They were like, we refuse. Like you would have to have two different screenings and invite us to different ones. We wouldn't even want to be in the same room. So I think that um, there's still a lot of like a really tough feeling. Um, and, but I do think, you know, all kinds of uh, conversations and, and types of solutions can still be can still emerge from this case at some point in time. Thank you for that. Uh, in, in the near the end of the, your film, um, actually the end of your film, um, you have a montage of sort of historical imagery, um, pictures of MLK, I think Yuri Kochiyama, uh, Chavez with uh, Larry, um, Chinese protesters with free Huey signs, Grace Lee Boggs, I think. Um, and uh, then Peter Liang and Akai Gurley. Um, do you think people get the messaging behind that? What do you think, Jason? That's a good question. Do we, do we think people get it? I think um, certainly Ursula had intention behind what those moments were. And I had intentions uh, just behind the juxtaposition of those images and kind of ending on that note. Um, I think I think the response to this film, it will be a mirror. I think it's, a, it's more of a mirror of the person watching it. Mm -hmm. um, and their takeaways from the film will reveal more about them than it does about the film itself. I, I do think that's also the power of the film. Um, and that's that's my answer to that. I think it's probably less about what we're trying to say in that moment, which is, I think, pretty obvious to the people who are coming at it from our perspective. Um, but, you know, uh, yeah, I, that's the best answer I have for that question. What do you think, Ursula? Do you think people get it? I, I think we always knew that there are different levels of what people will get out of the film. Like, obviously, Jason is a super watcher, and Jason, the, our Q&A host here. Right. Um, right. And uh, and you see all those you know those images flash like this. They're not slow. They're not slow at all. But you, a lot of them are iconic ones. If you've participated in any sort of like solidarity uh, movements, or if you've seen, if you know who Yuri and Grace Lee Boggs are. But we were, you know, choosing historical images where there were um, moments of solidarity, and and there were times when we thought like really very hard about those individual images, you know, whether or not, the, you know, we wanted them to be recognizable and sort of fast form, but also um, not all those moments were like perfectly clean and happy, you know, Disney stories either. So I think part of it was, you know, you know, in an ideal world, it would have been, maybe we could have had those like every single one be like a Disney image, but um, I think we sort of like fell, fell uh, you know, landed on it being like, these are all very complicated and all those movements were very complicated and hard fought and maybe not all successful. Um, and also that um, people were having a lot of emotional reactions to the film and they needed some sort of like, for other folks, people are just watching that and that is a moment where they're having like an emotional break where they can tune out and they can just sort of feel something. Um, you know, maybe it's the weight of history, maybe it's just the train passing, um, but, but we needed, you know, that was like really in large part Jason's uh, style that he brought to the film is like we needed some space and breathing room for people because there are folks that can watch that film and not be impacted emotionally and personally by all that's in the film, but there are other folks who are devastated by certain scenes and, and need, need that break. So um, we thought that, the, that those moments would serve both purposes. Uh, I, I just want to congratulate you for, for such a well-made uh, and beautiful documentary that's heart-wrenching at the same time. Um, ah, another question before we go. Uh, Pamela asks, it was amazing that you caught the scene where the Chinese American man walked across the street to speak to the woman instead of yelling from opposite camps at each other. Uh, did you witness other moments like this, but couldn't catch catch them on film? Oh, you guys have caught me in the fact that I didn't actually catch that moment. Um, 
But that moment actually, in fact, was caught by one of our cinematographers. So um, I, I felt very lucky when I saw, when I found that clip um, and realized that it was shot by somebody I knew and somebody who ultimately ended up filming um, the interview with the principal and all the footage around the principal and and, and also like the, the the anniversary banquet. So this great guy Tinks Chen um, filmed that. Um, so no, I actually, you know, that was my first day of filming. When that happened, that was my first day of filming on the on the project. And I had brought my, you know, my kind of old and janky camera out and, and there were so many people there. It was like physically hard to move. And I hadn't, you know, properly planned to shoot that day. I like, you know, the event was supposed to happen at 11 and I arrived at 11, like no dumb filmmaker would do that. Like you'd get there hours and hours in advance, you'd stake your spot and you'd know where the stuff was happening. You'd know all these people were gonna be speaking and, you'd have multiple cameras and it was just like me, um, like literally like trying to like shove my way through things. So like a lot of the shots that we have from that are like, you know, point of view stuff of me just like trying to get through the crowd. I did, I did feel very accomplished and there's like a one overhead shot. Um, I like went and like knocked, I asked somebody in a building that lived nearby, can I go up into your apartment? And, I, and some nice couple, it was actually an Asian and white couple, let me go into their like, 34 apartment and shoot out their tiny window, which didn't even open more than this, which is why the shot is so short. But um, cause I felt like it, people were not gonna believe how big it was unless I got some sort of aerial shot. But um, you know, a real filmmaker would have had like a drone that day and would have had like a beautiful sweeping shot of the crowd. But it was my first day and I didn't know we were making this film. Um, so yeah, no, I mean, we, I, you know, Michelle in particular was crying for more moments like this where we had sort of the cross-cultural conversation. There are very few of those moments in the film. Um, I think in reality, very few of those moments happened. You know, the cross-cultural conversations that happened were a lot of people yelling at each other that had their point of view already set. Um, so the dialogue was not happening as much. There was one scene, I don't think Jason edited as much with this one, but um, they did the, one of the, I think bar associations, um, they did like a, a panel discussion with black and Asian folks. And it was it was very interesting. It had Peter Kwok on the panel, who is now deceased, and um, a number of really interesting thought leaders. It was a little bit like wonky and not, um, you know, not driven by like the communities and the streets as much as the characters we have in the film. But um, that that scene was in there for a long time, and so that is sort of like a, there was definitely some debate in there that was very interesting. Um, but we didn't we didn't. Um, I mean, the question is, did we witness other moments like that we couldn't catch on film? Um, Probably, but you know, we just there weren't that many of them happening, really. And there are two communities that don't that don't often speak in that way, don't often interact, don't organize together. Typically, except in the cases like have with Kathy, um, and it's partially one thing that I discovered while editing the footage in that um, that Ursula helped illuminate from the Asian American side was just that you have generationally, they just two completely very distinct, different relationships with the police and African-Americans have been here um, for hundreds and hundreds of years and had a very specific experience with police from, with the police force as a force from, from slavery. Um, the Asian-Americans who were arriving in the 1990s or 1980s or 1960s um, have completely different context in their relationship with the police. Um, and then on top of that, the, the, the social, the socioeconomic level where you usually find minorities is typically a lower one. Um, the blacks in New York, at least the blacks are here, you know, and Chinatown is where lower income uh, uh, Asian American folks are. So you have, you don't have a mixing even on what you would usually have on a socioeconomic level to have that just dialogues that would naturally happen because of proximity um add to that the language barrier uh so it's just like i think there are many reasons to diagnose why those moments aren't happening more organically um but it is yeah it's a very interesting point that you yeah you don't it's actually quite antagonistic um and maybe one, more go ahead there's one. i was gonna say the one thing that we are lacking in you know more of in the film is the dialogue between sort of the uh asian american activists that were actually on the girly side and i think people crave that sometimes when they watch the film they want to see more of the asian american organizers for a kai 
but they were actually very specific in wanting to take sort of a different role in public role in, in supporting the movement because they felt it was important that the black activists were pushed to the front and had the loudest voices. So what we did in the edit and, you know, Jason Michelle did this very methodically was like the, a lot of the, um, those folks were actually there and they didn't want the, you know, Kathy didn't, you know, she says so in her interview, she didn't want her voice to, to displace, uh, you know, a black organizer's voice, but you'll see in every single um, protest, there is like an Asian person doing security for, or, or like doing support. And so their role, um, while we may have missed some conversations that happened, you know, like in organizing spaces before they went out into the streets, they, the, the presence of those folks was, is very visually like consistent throughout the film. And I think people should make sure they see that. Um, um, but, you know, uh, you know, that would also have been nice to have that footage at our disposal just to make those decisions on our own rather than have it be uh, just the fact of, of what we had and what we didn't have. So an, an, another one ke keeps rolling in, um, Joe. Uh, in smaller ways, the anxiety of sharing across communities happens all the time on buses, in church, at work, within homes. The dark stairways visceral presentation validates day-to-day -day efforts. Yeah. Um, I I did want to just touch on one thing. There, there's the restaurant scene where you have sort of this intergenerational table of um, um, Asians and Asian Americans talking about, um, I don't know if it's strategy or how um, the the protests were actually being perceived by, by different folks. And um, I, I think one of them was the gentleman who came out to the middle of the street to the other side to talk to talk to that woman. And um, uh, he says uh, the meaning of the protest was being hijacked, um, saying that you are just here for Whitey. And uh, I, I thought that was a, sort of a, a really uh, pivotal moment in the film to sort of the understanding for, um, I don't know, the characters or the audience of um, characters who are missing, which is you don't have a lot of principles or any, I think, that are, are white. Um, but you that was intentional. <laughs> yeah, we did not, we, we did not do any interviews nor seek any interviews with uh, white commentators or participants. Um, you know, this was, there's, there's rare opportunity for our communities to get screen time period and rare opportunities for us to have dialogue together. And, um, you know, this was, I hate to use this phrasing because people argue against it, but it's sort of a for us by us film, you know, this is a creative team of people of color. Most of the leadership and the people present in these protests were people of color and, um, and I think it's an, a diff definitely a different dynamic. Um, what Chris is talking about is what a lot of people accuse the Asian American community of in general is, is wanting to have, um, you know, people understand that our community is not, doesn't have all the equality and all the, the benefits that an average American has, but, but, but folks are accuse our community of wanting to have the things that white people have rather um, at the expense uh, at the expense of all kinds of other um, ethics and uh, and I think that may be true for some people and it may not be true for others. And I think that's a, that's a, a point that people need to clarify when they're fighting for, for, um, for new ways of, of um, you know, for, for things for the Asian American community. You know, it's, uh, you know, in this particular case, it's like, you know, do you want Peter to be treated like the white cops and, and, and uh, have no comp, you know, no punishment or do you want all cops to be treated uh, and get some punishment for when they kill somebody. I mean, I think that's a very clear and clean question. Yeah, not so clear and clean when you're on the ground, I think. Um, but I, I've gotten a time check. It is uh, four o'clock. Uh, I, I do wanna um, move to um, talk a little bit about, um, you are getting distribution through uh, PBS. Is that is that right later this year? I believe in April? Yeah, you guys are the lucky folks that see it uh, before everybody else. Um, it's gonna be April 12th on 
uh, a, a series called Independent Lens, which is, I believe, 10 o'clock in most markets, and maybe maybe it's 9 o'clock in Central Market. Um, so, um, you know, please follow along. Uh, and uh, if you like the film or if you want to watch it again and again and again, like Jason, um, uh, it'll be playing for free on the 12th. And we'll have a streaming period online after that. So um, for folks who are not too young to like be dedicated to PBS, like download that PBS app. There's great films on there and, and you can watch them um, free all the time, including ours in April. And I believe um, you were mentioning that there was a um, sort of an educational guide or discussion guide. Oh yeah, some exciting things are happening through PBS and I really want to give a lot of love to PBS as an outlet that shares and appreciates Asian American stories. One is that they're translating the film into Chinese. So there will be a version, it won't be, I don't believe in most markets they'll air that version unless they do it at like an alternate time or an alternate screening, but um, we've translated it into Chinese. And so um, if this is a story that you think you could share with somebody who's less language proficient, that's gonna be like an amazing opportunity. And um, I believe it's the first time they've ever done it. Um, and then there are also, there are going to be some um, engagement opportunities that we hope to do like both before and after the broadcast. Um, they're creating a discussion guide, which now is like, I don't know, 18 plus pages that'll really help unpack a lot of the film um, for folks that need a little bit of guidance or want to use it as a teaching tool or as an organizing tool. Um, you know, I've always been anxious about how the film will be received. And I think that there's plenty of people who are going to dislike lots of things about the film. But I do think even if you don't like the film, there are a lot of um, ways in which it can be used to drive conversations. Um, and you can just point out the things you don't like and use that to drive a conversation. So I, I hope that it will be used going forward to, to really um, open up a lot of um, dialogue between our communities, within our communities, and outside of them. And that's so absolutely needed. Um, I just want to give a plug that uh, we're going to have another conversation with Ursula around um, uh, the, the role of, thanks for spending so much time with us, by the way, um, uh, the role of an API filmmaker in the Black Lives Matters movement. And we'll get into, I, I think, a lot more conversation around what this means and um, what is our responsibility. Um, so uh, please join us for that. That'll be part of the main Disorient uh, Film Festival. Um, and Ursula, you are currently working on another documentary. Could you say a little about that? Oh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say anything about it now, but um, we should talk about Jason's documentary that he's working on. I will say that, you know, that conversation we're having coming up, um, I'm helping, I'm helping, uh, it's with Tad Nakamura and uh, Karen, and uh, I am helping Tad on his film, uh, Third Act, which is going to be an amazing nice. film. It's a portrait about his dad, who is an icon in the Asian American community um, and their relationship as, uh, dad is dealing with uh with health issues um so i'm really excited about that film and and um the work that tad is doing and i think we should throw it at jason because um he's got some name dropping that he needs to do before we leave <laughs> um uh, i uh, ursula's secret project is very 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 cool uh, when when she gets to talk about that um no i'm i'm just wrapping up a documentary on kanye west which is um, it's what you might call about the old Kanye uh, before he released his first record. There was somebody filming him for um, a number of years. And so it's never, never been seen before until now. Um, and so that will be announced shortly and then um, it'll be coming out end of year. So that's what I'm working on. And it's also like the last day of Black History Month. And like Jason is always doing right. these amazing commercials for Black History Month. And he's got one, at least one running right now, right? Yeah. For for um for Facebook, there's a there's an ad running that I that I made. Um so yeah, this is like the the very last day of Black History Month, actually. Is a a short month. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, that deserves a shout out. Um but uh, yeah, but thank, thanks again to Ursula for, um, for inviting me to collaborate on this film. It was really special. And Jason, thanks for your comments about it. I'm, I'm really happy to, to hear that it's resonating uh, with yeah. you and everybody. I, 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 I absolutely adore and love this film. Uh, I want to appreciate all your hard work and all your 
uh, blood, sweat, tears that went into this, uh, all the secondary trauma y'all had to go through. Um, but uh, such an important film. And uh, I, I think that uh, once it premieres uh, nationwide, this is going to be talked about a whole lot. Um, I, I, I do want to give you the last word. Is there anything you want to leave our audience with? I mean, I guess I'm just thinking now that your local audience, I'm really sorry that this is a, a virtual festival this year because I would love to be here. And I think that you guys locally are dealing with some very, um, you know, there's a lot of emotion around these topics in, in, in your local um, market. And I hope that folks um, could see some like parallels in our film and also um, maybe some positive ways to move forward and, and sort of like, drive the conversations locally because it's such an important place for these um, for these stories to be talked about and these conversations to be had. So thank you all for tuning in. I really appreciate that. And um, thank you, Jason and Jason. I love talking to both of you. So glad we could get together on a Sunday. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, thank Ursula. You appreciate it. The film, um, Down a Dark Stairwell. Catch it on PBS later uh, in April. Thank you, everybody.